Okay. So that the um, first presentation, I'm going to focus on the piece that most people think about when they're grant writing, and that is writing the body of the grant. Now, keep in mind that there are other very, very important sections of the grant. It's not all about the research plan, and there'll be a presentation later on in this series of lectures that is talking about the parts of the grant that aren't specific aims and research plan, okay? Also, this presentation is very, very NIH focused, which for most of the people on the MRDA is probably appropriate, as even if you're not funded by the NIH, that other sorts of biomedical research funders use the same general structure typically. Um, However, there are, of course, other grants that have different formats, and I'll just say that straight up. Okay, so the thing about a research grant um, for the NIH is, is that you actually are writing the topic, about the topic of your grant, four different places in four different ways. And each of these places might not even be read by the same people. They each have a different audience. And I'm gonna walk you through what the four pieces of the grant are, what the audience is, and why, um, how that informs how you're going to be writing those sections. And those four pieces are the project summary, the public health relevance, the specific aims, and the research plan. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the project summary. Um, now, the project summary is written sort of like a traditional abstract. The reader, though, is really meant to be the general public. Um, the project summary is what is posted publicly on the NIH um, reporter website, which has information about every single funded NIH grant. Um, now, the readers can also be the research community. Like, if you want to know what is NIH funding in my general area, you can actually do searches in NIH Reporter and it will pull up every single grant that is funded by the federal government or by the NIH in your area of interest. And it will give you the abstract of those grants. So, when you're writing your project summaries, Keep in mind that anything you write, you want to, you're completely fine, have it be public and in the public record. And this will include people who are your competitors. And it's also how the general public's going to perceive your work. It also can be the press reads these. Um, just as an example, a few years ago, I was contacted, there was a big thing about human fetal tissue research. And I had the word fetus in my um, NIH grant summary for one of my funded grants. Well, it turns out I was studying mouse fetuses, but they did a search for fetus, and I was getting contacted by reporters who wanted to discuss my human fetal tissue research, which I wasn't doing. So there's an example where you can be targeted because of what's in your abstract. It also can be of an issue depending on what you write in that abstract, it can result in you being targeted by organizations such as PETA, who might be searching NIH reporter for research that is formulated in a way that they would find problematic. So as you write your public project summary, you want to just keep it in mind is, is that you don't want anything in the project summary that could make yourself a target um, for various groups that you might not be going to be targeted by. Um, it is also what Congress um, reads. Congressional staffers do read what NIH is funding. Um, it's also what study section members who are reviewing grants for the NIH will see as the scope of work in any kind of um, grant renewal. So you, you wrote in a grant, you got it funded, and in three or four years, you go back in asking for more money. The only thing the study section members have to go on about your about what the scope was of the prior award 
is what's written in the project summary. Um, the format of the project summary is just a standard non-structured abstract. Um, Now, when you're writing the project summary, you know, keep in mind of that audience um, that most of the space, use it to describe the problem and emphasize why it's important. Uh, the project summaries are what inform the world about uh, why NIH should be funded. Probably the most important audience is, in fact, the congressional staffers who are looking for waste, fraud, and abuse in federal funding. So you want to make it super clear why the work that you're proposing is very, very important. Um, as I mentioned, this is what organizations like PETA use to try to find research that they consider problematic. So you want to descri avoid describing things that could be controversial politically or might look bad to the lay public that are naive about the kinds of work that are being done or need to be done. Um, and this is um, the this is where congressional staffers search looking for waste, fraud, and abuse in federal research scientific funding. Um, I would highly recommend if you're interested in this idea um, to go to this article that was published in The Scientist a few years ago. Um, there used to be, back in the 1980s, these things called Golden Fleece Awards. And Golden Fleece Awards were congressional staffers working for a senator named William Proxmire would essentially try to search for what, NI, what the federal government is funding for research. And they basically brought that back to their senator who would highlight about how in federal funding for research needs to be cut because all this um, research that is useless or silly um, is being funded. And very often, they were targeting very important research, but they didn't understand how experimental models could be so valuable to determine how science and medicine work. Um, the other thing that I would recommend for project summaries is to keep that description of the work to be performed quite vague. Um, some of this is, is that you don't want to tip your hand about what you're working on in great detail to other scientists. This is basically you're publicly saying, I'm working on this, and if you give too much detail, you know, it's possible you can be scooped, especially as a young scientist. If somebody who is, has a much larger research group can swoop in and scoop your project if um, your ideas are too public. Also that if you're funded, you don't necessarily want to have the reviewers of your competing renewal know what exactly you focused on. Like I would recommend don't say specific aim one I'm doing X and specific aim two I'm doing Y. And this is because your scope of work will change during the time that your grant is funded. And that if you just say I'm studying this general area that what will count as progress on that grant can be used to encompass that scope. If you give an extremely detailed set of experiments that you end up not doing because your scope of work changes somewhat because of, um, you know, maybe you disproved an early hypothesis and you use that money to um, measure a related hypothesis, you want to make sure that will count over your general scope of work. Um, all right. Okay. So, is everybody fine on scope of on the um, on the um, that's that section? Um, do I have any questions? Let me just see. All right. So. Okay. So it looks like there's nobody who's asked a question on the chat. So with that, I'm going to talk about the next section, um, which is the public health relevance. Um, that is also the general public, and this is the document posted publicly on NIH Reporter. And again, the readers can be the research community, the general public, the press, NIH administrative staff, and Congress. 
And the public health relevance statement is actually there primarily, I think, for congressional staffers to read and the general public. It's essentially explaining why in two to three sentences this should be funded by the NIH. What is its relevance to the mission of the NIH, which is to um, improve the health of Americans? Um, and it's also, it tries to proactively educate people about why a piece of work is important. Um, the, the public health relevance and the, um, that um, narrative abstract are the only two pieces of information that are public, the only two pieces of information that Congress can read. Um, so, and they're also like the two pieces of information that let's say the people who go and um, to testify in front of the congressional um, committees that decide NIH funding have access to. So they're super important, both these sections, but the thing you have to understand is, is that neither of these sections may be read at all by the reviewers of your grant. That I know personally, when I have a grant to review, I might glance at the public health relevance, I might glance at the abstract, but they're really not um, a point of focus um, for the review part of the application. That said, the public health relevance and the project narrative need to be written so that they can completely stand alone and be understandable, completely separate from the rest of the grant, because in most cases they will be read separate from the rest of the grant. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to now talk about the specific aims page. And the specific aims page is something you will hear people talk about and focus um, on. And it is, can be argued that a well-crafted specific aims page is the most important piece of the grant. Um, its audience is mostly internal to NIH. The um, readers are those making study section assignments as well as institute assignments. So when a grant comes into NIH, the specific aims page are what are reviewed, and they're reviewed to match your grant to the scope of the 26 institutes and centers that fund NIH grants. They also, um, is this is what's read by those making initial study section assignments, in other words, they will determine what the focus of the grant is and they will send your grant to a specific review body. Um, it's also read by the study section members. It's pretty much read by everybody on the study section that's going to be reviewing your grant, um, both those who are assigned to write written critiques, but keep in mind that for when a grant is re reviewed in an NIH study section, there may be 30 members of the study section. Only three will read your entire grant. The other 27 will likely only be reading the specific aims page, and they're only going to be reading it in the 15 minutes when the grant is being discussed. Um, the specific aims page is also read by other NIH administrative staff, as well as the Board of Scientific Counselors, which is the group that does second tier scientific review for all NIH grants. So the specific aims page is essentially how your grant is judged by the vast majority of people who have power to make a decision about what your grant is going to be. So this needs to be super clear about why, what you're doing, why we care, and what questions that you're trying to answer. For NIH, it's one page single space. Um, it sets up the scientific problem, what questions you plan to answer, your hypothesis, and your set of objectives um, given as specific aims. Um, you really should consider the specific aims page as the technical abstract of your grant. Um, it is, um, it needs to be able to completely stand on 
on its own and be completely understandable as a one-page grant. It is also another group of people who will read the specific aims page are when a study section member is assigned your grant, they will read the specific aims page to decide whether they have the technical expertise to actually give the grant a good review or not. Um, so it's, it's also um, the first pass of setting up the idea in people's minds of, do I actually care about this work or not? Um, having people be interested and excited about your work and thinking it's important to do is probably more than half the battle with NIH grant writing or any grant writing. And a good specific aims page will basically say, allow somebody to say, is this really boring or is this really interesting problem that needs to be addressed? Okay. Um, now there's, um, you know, some really important things to consider when you're writing your specific aims page. It needs to be freestanding and easily understandable with those that have no access to the grant body. I usually recommend that you write an initial paragraph that clearly describes the scientific problem and its significance, set up that who cares. Think of this as the elevator talk for a grant. In one paragraph, what is the problem? What are you doing to solve it? And why should I care about it? It then often should um, lead into your specific aims, which outline two to four objectives or problems that the research is intending to accomplish or solve. It is super important to include the H word or hypothesis at least once on your aims page. Um, it can be good to include it several times as the objectives are described. Um, that that hypothesis should be supported by some of the key evidence supporting the idea that it's true. Different people have different approaches to writing this and how to work out the hypothesis. Sometimes there's a global hypothesis with a couple objectives to address the hypothesis. Personally, I prefer to have each aim being I, aim one is to test the hypothesis that such and such and such. Or you can say that the aim has an objective and then in when you're just explaining the aim, you can say that what the overarching hypothesis are. Um, I have the, um, that I have included in the list of um, things that were um, uploaded with Aaron. There is, an, in fact, a specific aims page for a funded grant. If I remember correctly, I think it's one of mine. Um, so you can kind of see my views of how to write a good specific aims page. Um, now, some things to avoid on a specific aims page. This is not a place where you give any in-depth technical descriptions of how you will accomplish it. You don't talk about your Western blots. You don't talk about the details of your experimental design, um, that what you want to do is um, you want to make sure the objectives and how accomplishing that objective will move the field forward. You don't, the methods are not, they don't go there, they go in the main body of the grant. Um, there is one of the articles that I um, sent you is called Your Grant, the Rejected Recipe, or the Funded Menu. Um, it essentially is focusing on the idea of talking about big picture versus how you're going to accomplish the big picture. And they have a very nice analogy of if you're talking about what the accomplished thing is, the accomplishment is maybe it's that um, farm-raised artisanal chicken versus how do you go about growing the chicken, plucking the chicken, and baking the chicken, that that's kind of the difference. You want to have this AIMS page essentially focus on what the objective is and what are we going to get out of what your aim is. Um, now, another thing that can be a really big mistake is that people craft the AIMS page and then they write the experimental section, 
And the experimental section, they have a bunch of experiments, but they don't actually get at the actual hypothesis that is given. So you want to um, make sure that your experiments will objectively assess um, the, that the experiments will objectively accept, assess that hypothesis. Um, it's really easy to go down a rabbit hole of experimental design, and you end up testing hypotheses that are not your stated global hypothesis of your grant. The other thing that I highly recommend is that on your AIMS page, actually use the word impact and explicitly give an impact statement. Um, it should be the, a one to two sentence takeaway of how this proposed work will move the field forward. It's, you need to be very explicit about this. Um, keep in mind that impact is not significance. There can be lots of um, things that you can test that are significant, but impact brings in the idea of will this work make a sustained influence on the field? And will the, so if this is all accomplished, really what new thing will tell this? Impact is not to restate what you're doing. Impact is if I learn these things, how is the field going to be better? And it's actually the score of an NIH grant is called the impact score. And it's a conglomeration of everything going into this. What's the scientific problem? What's the approach? What are your skills as an investigator? Um, do you have the patient base to do this? Is your environment going to let this work um, be successful at the highest levels? And all of those things come together in that final impact number. Okay. All right. Where am I? Okay. So um, I'm going to pause for a minute and just see if anybody has questions on putting specific games pages together. And you don't have to ask questions now. You should feel free to essentially, um, you know, send emails and stuff about anything you don't necessarily get or if you have specific questions about your own situation. So the um, next session, which is considered the meat of the grant, is the research plan. Um, the audience of this is really, to be perfectly honest, you're going to be probably spending your most time on the research plan, and it's only going to ever be read by three people, and those are your three assigned reviewers. Um, it is possible that the other people on the study section will skim it, but it is extremely unlikely that anybody else is ever going to read the research plan. It's not going to be read by the scientific review officer. It's not going to be read by the program officer making the funding decision. It's probably not going to be read by the Board of Scientific Counselors. Okay. Um, now, the three... Um, assigned reviewers on your grant that you're going to probably have a primary and a secondary reviewer assigned who are the closest you're going to get to a subject matter expert in the grant review. However, the last reviewer, reviewer three, is going to be somebody who is knowledgeable. They're going to be a well-regarded scientist. They're actually um, at the study section, that is by definition who they are, but they are unlikely to be field-specific experts in your area. And that, so your audience is, for the research plan, is both people who are in the big area, but not in your exact area, as well as direct subject matter experts. Now, the format and the length is going to highly depend on what you're applying for. If you're applying for a um, R01, it's 12 pages separated into three sections, significance, innovation, and approach. 
If you're applying for a K award or an R15, it's going to be shorter. If you're applying for an R01, R21 or an R03, it's going to be shorter. Um, but no matter what format, research plans usually have three sections, including a section where you talk about significance, where you talk about innovation, and where you talk about approach. And this is the meat of your proposal. This is where you're really going to explain what you're proposing in depth, why anybody should care, and how this work will move the field forward. Now, one thing to understand about how NIH grants are reviewed is that in a typical NIH study section, there's about 30 people who are members of the study section, that each um, grant will get three of those 30 people as the reviewers who are charged with reading the entire thing. And they're the ones who will write the actual written critiques. As the grant is, um, and they will write those written critiques in isolation, and they will give initial scores in isolation. Now, those, what NNIH reviewers really being asked to do is, are these, is the grant great, or is the grant okay, or is the grant terrible? The grants that are in the top 50% of um, grants that are submitted to the study section, now the typical study section has 100 grants being reviewed over the course of a two-day meeting. So what that means is, is that only the grants that score in the initial scores in the top half will be discussed. Now, effectively, what discussion means is, is that the, if the assigned reviewer gives your grant a good score, they're being asked to publicly defend your work. They will be asked to explain what your grant is about to the other uh, 27 members of that study section who have not read the grant. They will be asked then to justify why your grant is so fabulous and why it absolutely has to be done and why your work will make a major impact on the field. So not only does the reviewer need to think your grant is good, these assigned reviewers have to be so convinced of this that they're willing to put their public reputation on the line to defend your work to the other 29 members of the study section who are all their scientific peers, okay? So it's important to write your grant with that in mind. You need to give the reviewer the ammunition that they need to justify why your work is so much better than everybody else's that it deserves a good score, which is the first step in getting your proposal funded, okay? So when you're putting this together, you're essentially um, need to think about this as your opportunity to elaborate on the big picture scientific question being pursued. It can be an intro to the whole field. Um, remember that reviewer three um, might need that intro to the field. They might not actually know that this is a problem of importance. Um, that you definitely, as you're considering um, how to write the significant section, you need to be thinking about who can be reading it. So you definitely want to be identifying what study section might end up reviewing it, who are the scientists on that study section, what is their background, um, because you need to be putting yourself into the shoes of, the, of who's going to be reviewing it. Think about what they know, what they don't know, and give them the information that they need to understand that your work is super important. Um, now, in the significance section, though, don't sell the significance of your individual aims here. Um, and the reason that that's important, that you don't want to front load all the significance in the significance section, is you have to, th again, think about the reviewer. These are all working scientists with full-time jobs, families, lives. When they have time to do the reviews, it's probably after the kids were put to bed, 
it might be at the end of a long day, that they might not have time to sit and read your entire grant in a single sitting. So if they read the significance section um, a day between they, they read the significance and they read the research plan, they might forget some, some key details of the significance. So that I usually recommend that you write an overall significance in the significance section and then weave the significant, the sub-significance of each aim along with the preliminary data for each aim within an individual aim. That you want to basically give the reviewer the information they need to review your grant um, in right where they're assessing the science. For that reason, for a 12-page research plan, I usually only write one page of significance and leave a lot of the aim-specific significance later into the approach section. Um, that you have to write it because if it's well written, your readers, which are your three main reviewers, are going to be convinced the area is important and that there are key knowledge gaps that must be filled which if you can't convince your reader of this, they're never going to get up and say, and publicly defend your work saying that this needs to be funded. Um, the next section is the innovation section. Um, this is considered a scorable criteria. NIH wants to fund innovative stuff that is really going to use either innovative approaches that um, addresses innovative hypotheses or innovative ideas. Um, now, while it is a scorable criteria, though, um, a number of NIH studies have looked at what are the various um, pieces of the score that drive the final impact score. And innovation is generally a um, it has a very low impact on the final score that your grant will get, which is the one that counts. Um, so a proposal can be not particularly innovative and still get a really high score um, for the final, final fundable score. But innovation always helps. Um, you want to basically um, talk about um, some things that can drive innovation or how does this application challenge or seeks to shift current research or clinical practice paradigms? Um, does this really try to move or change dogma? Um, does it include novel theories, novel approaches, novel methodologies? Maybe it will be the first time that a established methodology is going to be applied to this specific problem. Um, Maybe you've developed a new methodology or you're testing whether a new clinical innovation is going to have an impact on clinical practice. Now, the NIH guidelines don't have a specific length, um, but I usually confine these to just um, four to six sentences. Um, that the innovation ideally will shine through but this is a place where you can point out to the reviewers how your work is innovative. Okay. So do I have any questions on innovation? Okay. So I'll move finally to the approach. Uh, the approach section is the meat of the grant. I would absolutely um, keep the vast majority of whatever pages you have for um, research plan, save most of them for approach. Um, that if I'm running an R01 grant that is 12 pages, I have confined my significance and innovation to 1.3 pages, which leads 10.7 pages for the approach session of my grant. Um, that the format that I would recommend is, is, is that you state your aim um, give your hypothesis if it is not already in the aim name. And that for each aim, I then give a statement of background and preliminary data that are supporting that hypothesis. And, it out, and NIH uses a term called the scientific premise. 
scientific premise is essentially what is the evidence that is out there that supports your hypothesis. It also um, is a place where if there is some data out there that's counter to your hypothesis, you need to bring that up and directly address why you don't think that it has, that that other information has disproven your hypothesis. Um, just as an example, I just came from a study section last week where somebody had proposed an experiment that was to test a specific hypothesis where there was a paper out there where someone else had already um, published work that seemed to disprove the investigator's hypothesis. And this paper wasn't even, um, wasn't even explained or cited in the grant. Keep in mind that your reviewers are experts. Your reviewers also know about PubMed and they know about Google Scholar. And they will often, in a thorough review, um, do an independent literature search on seeing what is the evidence for your assertions. It looks really bad if you're not citing key work by others that are supporting your hypothesis. And it also looks bad if you're not citing key work by others that might lead to the rejection of your hypothesis. Um, that you want to bring up saying that somebody else thinks this is true, but I don't think that that, that is the case for these evidence-based reasons. Um, again, you don't want the reviewer to be the one to point that out. Um, you then want to explain what experiments or approaches you're gonna use to test that hypothesis. I personally think that's best done in sub-aims. So, so if you think that you need four or five key experimental um, setups to test your hypothesis that you can then have sub-aim um, aim one, sub-aim point one, sub-aim point two, point three, point four. Um, that each aim should have pitfalls and alternate approaches. Um, that I would highly recommend do not leave the pitfalls and alternate approaches to the end of the aim. Give the pitfalls and alternate approaches as each sub-aim is uh, given. You also want to explicitly describe for expected um, outcomes, explicitly describe what the data will look like if the hypothesis is supported and what will it look like if the hypothesis is rejected. And you want to talk about how you will move your work forward if the hypothesis is rejected. Don't say that specific aim one will show that X equals Y. That is making it sound like you have predetermined what the answer will be, that you are actually have a hypothesis that you're testing. Make sure it's clear that you're open to the hypothesis being disproven. Okay. Now, another thing about aims is avoid the dreaded dependent aim. Um, and dependent aims are if you could only do aim two if aim one is successful. Um, they're very, very reluctant to give a good score for a grant where you could only do aim one, aim two if aim one is successful. And this is because that if AIM-1 fails, then the rest of the grant has failed. And it's not clear how you're still gonna get good information out of this, okay? Now, it is really important to be pretty explicit to explain how the results obtained will prove or disprove the hypothesis and be objective and critical. Um, a couple of huge mistakes people make is, is that correlation is not causation. And also don't overinterpret what the experiment will tell you. Um, that a big reason that, that grants don't get good scores is, is that um, the uh, writer is mixing up correlations and causations or that the experiments do not actually test the hypothesis stated, okay? Um, now, one thing is, is that grants also 
you have to address how the integrity of the reagents, whether they're animal cell lines, antibodies, it could be um, reliability of clinical diagnoses <coughs> is insured. You also have to really talk about your statistical plans. Um, for those of you doing clinical anal uh, research, power analysis is really, really key. You have to really convince the reviewers that you're, um, <coughs> you have enough patients to really test what's going on here. Um, you also want to, want to step back and just look at whether the project, which is the preliminary data you're giving, as well as the experiments you're proposing, is that clearly going to result in a publication or maybe or multiple publications? Um, those of you who are applying to um, either the CTR or the Embry pilot grant programs, both of those programs are wanting to see is what you're proposing going to lead to publications or is it going to give you the preliminary data that you need to then apply for additional grant funding in the future? And if that isn't really clear, if it seems that there's still going to be a lot of holes so that you won't have what you need to apply to the next grant or you're not going to have the data you need to result in a publication, that can be a really, really big fall flaw in an approach section. Okay. Um, now, another really important thing, especially for people who are new investigators, as um, most of the people on the call, um, if this project is in the early stages of development, um, you want to describe strategies to establish um, feasibility. So can you actually use that technique in this experimental system? That what's high risk? That if there's any kind of high risk um, strategies, um, how do you uh, manage those? Um, this high risk aspects could be maybe you're going to have trouble recruiting patients into your trial. Maybe it's going to turn out that this experimental method will not work in this experimental model. Um, this part of this um, mitigating high risk can be making sure you've recruited the correct collaborators or the correct subject matter experts that will help you troubleshoot an experimental design. Um, this could be if you're doing a lot of genomics, maybe you need a bioinformatics person to help you. If you're doing um, clinical research with a patient population, maybe this will be uh, somebody who is very, very has in-depth knowledge and expertise working with a particular patient population. You also want to point out anything that is a procedure or a situation or material that's hazardous um, and any precautions to be utilized. Um, there's actually a separate section even on the use of select agents if anybody's working on any with any kind of um, drug, chemical, or um, pathogen that could be hazardous. Now, another thing about the design of the AIMS, this goes back to the truth is, if your grant is going to get a good enough score to be in the fundable range, that you have had to convince three reviewers that they like your work enough that they will advocate for it in front of the study section in the actual study section meeting. You want to give them the most ammunition possible to convince everyone that this grant is going to make a prolonged impact on the field. So I already mentioned have an impact statement at the end of your AIMS page. I would highly recommend that you have an impact statement at the end of each AIM so that if that AIM is accomplished, what is the impact of that AIM in the field? Um, and then finally, there should be an, another overall impact statement at the end of the approach. Um, it is not good to end a grant on a description of a pitfall. You do not want the last thing the reviewer to read is a reason why an experiment isn't going to work. You want to fully remind them why this work is super important to be doing 
Um, and that gives that strong finish that emphasizes why that work is critical to be funded. Okay. So um, is, do I have any um, questions or anything that anybody wants to ask at this point? Um, I have a couple more slides and then I'll just open it up also generally for questions. But if anybody has anything specific right now. Okay. So some final thoughts is, is that um, a lot of times people are like, oh, I have to write a 12 page grant. Um, I, well, I want to write that R03 because it's only a six-page research plan. The problem is that NIH has first, that in the old days, and I'm old enough to remember when an NIH grant was 25 pages long, it actually was a nice length. It wasn't too long. It actually gave you the room you needed to really explain everything. But what's happened in the past 10 years is, is that first they cut the length of a full-blown NIH grant from 25 pages to 12 pages. And then over the past 10 years, they keep adding new topics that must be addressed. Um, this has included impact statements. This has included um, sex as a biological variable in your studies. This has included um, adding statements of um, scientific premise and so forth. So what we're being asked to do is write a clearly understandable proposal that addresses everything that we want to address in smaller and smaller spaces. So what can happen with a naive writer is, is that they write to the page limit. They think, I have a five page um, experimental plan. And they will write in write it five pages and they say, oh, I can't address anything more. I can't talk about anything more. I can't explain anything more because it gets too long. The thing, the reality though, is, is that most of us are extremely wordy writers. We write things that are redundant, that use a lot of excess verbiage. A really great example is the tendency that people say is, it has been shown that. Well, we can easily just say it is. And we have a lot more space. And so that what I usually recommend to people is, is that you write your grant irregardless of length. Write it as long as it needs to be to say everything that needs to be said. And your first draft should be written without regard to page limits. Um, it's not at all unusual that when I write an R01, which is 12 page proposal, my first draft might be 18 pages long because I'm writing it long enough to get everything I need to be saying into it. Um, it's once I have everything that needs to be said down, then I start editing for length and editing for refining what I say. And it's actually not that hard to get an 18 page grant down to 12 pages with, um, word, with wordsmithing. And gets, you can get rid of all the passive voice. It, you can get rid of all the things you said three times in three different ways. Um, one of the articles is a kind of an extreme example. It's called Polishing Your Prose by um, Word by Unnecessary Word. And it's actually funny is that they take a one page piece of writing and they basically analyze it down to one sentence because it turns out the writer took one page to say one sentence of information in all sorts of different ways. And it's honestly, when I write my grants, um, I often will spend the last 10 days to two weeks prior to the submission taking my first draft and editing and wordsmithing and refining it and tightening up my language, making sure I can get in my 12 pages everything I want to say. And I've never had to delete 
important information. I have only had to delete excess verbiage or there's this tendency to want to introduce everything that you want to say in, um, in great detail to the field. When you're actually giving irrelevant information to the reviewer, that is just confusing. So, you know, really give yourself this time to write and craft these grants in a good way. And um, to be honest, the MRDA, a lot of it is meant to give you the time you need to develop your proposals well. So um, that's all I want to say right this second. Um, that I see that we basically got pretty much the whole group on the call. So at this point, um, I'm going to open it up for oral questions, or if people just want to um, put questions in the chat, I can do that as well. That of the group, um, and you can feel free to respond in the chat to this, how many people have already started to craft your specific aims page for your final submission of, or what or actually can people just put in the chat what they're planning on applying for that would actually be somewhat helpful okay so i got you mentioned sex as a biological variable other things that need to be included are in the rfa sometimes yes sometimes no um, that the, so there are specific RFAs for proposals. There's also the, um, for NIH, they have a big master um, set of instructions. And they can be, um, and the master instructions for an NIH grant are about 100 pages long. And a lot of that is information that's more of interest to the grants office than to you. Um, but there's sections that are just super easy to forget. And a lot of those are things I'm going to cover in this lecture on um, that on things beyond the research plan. But certain things such as um, data sharing has to be addressed. Um, your statistical plan in the research body has to be addressed. Um, also, validation of biological resources has to be addressed. And those of you who are doing any kind of like experimental lab science, how are you going to prove that your cell line really is, like if you're saying your cell line is a kidney and cancer cell line, how do you validate it's really a kidney cancer cell line? Um, if you're doing um, big data analysis, how are you going to disseminate your large data sets? Um, there's a lot of that sort of stuff that is actually addressed in sections that are not the main body of the grant. Um, probably the big one, though, that people are getting themselves into the most trouble with is sex as a biological variable. Um, one of my colleagues here just got their grant um, their grant flag for that because for years they were using male mice for their studies, and that's actually not um, allowed anymore. Um, you have to include female mice in your studies, assuming that there's not a good justification. It's already been shown that gender is not a um, is not actually a variable, but then you have to cite that. Um, actually, um, I just thought of one for those of you who are doing clinical studies. It's um, basically inclusion along the lifespan. It used to be that there was a section where you would have to talk about inclusion of children. Um, but now that if you're studying disease across the lifespan, you have to, like if you are just studying children, you need to explain and justify why you're just studying children. Or if you're studying the elderly, you need to explain why you're not including people at other age points. There's an awful lot of disease work that is um, talking about inclusion along the lifespan. Um, so I got, looks like I got answers about what people are applying for. It looks like um, CTR pilots are definitely 
a big one. Um, I see a couple people who are applying for R01s and that they've started AIMS pages, um, R21s and K99s ROOs. So there's a basically, um, I'm seeing largely NIH mechanisms here. Um, I absolutely would encourage you to seek out other sources of funding, and I do talk about this in another one of these workshops. There's also some recorded um, workshops on seeking out other funding opportunities, because especially if, for those of you who are young investigators, there's a lot of foundation money out there for many kinds of research if you're within certain time, if you're newly hired, newly independent, um, certain times um, in your career that there's a window where there's a decent amount of early career foundation money. Um, and then I, I definitely see an American Society of Hematology grant um, that I see. So um, just a note to Stephanie, if you would like to share with me your prior submissions as well as your reviews on the prior submissions. I'd be happy to sort of give you my read about what the reviewers were saying to you. And um, we can just um, schedule like a time to have a Zoom meeting offline and to give you a little bit of feedback from my view. Um, I didn't actually introduce myself. Um, I am a professor of biology at the University of Delaware. Um, I have been continuously NIH funded now for 20 some years, and I have been a, both a permanent member of study sections as well as currently I probably ad hoc three or four times a year on study sections currently. So I have a lot of experience um, on both the writing and reviewing side of grants as well as I've been official mentor to a number of faculty members over the years as well, um, and to help people try to get their grant funding. So um, very happy to give anybody who wants some feedback on things. And if you'd like some feedback before we go and do the peer review of each other's stuff. Um, so um, I got a question about unfunded foundation grants without feedback. So what I would say is, is that um, try to see if you can get internal review. Um, one mistake, I, you know, I, and I don't know how you have funded your things, but very often people write their grants for the deadline. So they're still working on their bodies of their grants, and they really aren't getting a lot of internal feedback from people, ideally. Um, that you want to have your proposal first drafts done three or four weeks out if you can. Um, that so in your mind's eye, pretend your deadline is a month before it really is, and then seek out your colleagues to read and review them. And a colleague that's willing to give you extensive critical feedback is worth their weight in gold. Um, so if you have some unfunded foundation grants, that, you know, if you want to send them to me, you know, feel free. I'm not really a clinical researcher, and especially those of you who do mixed methods survey types research, I am definitely not an expert in mixed methods type methodologies, but I can at least give you feedback about whether or not you have brought out the significance of what you're doing and why they should care. Um, because sometimes for foundations, what you're running into is a mismatch between the goals of the foundation and how you're presenting your work. Um, and I can maybe help you with that. But I would definitely seek out your mentors, see what they're saying, see what they're looking out. And please, please, please be open to constructive criticism. Um, sometimes people will avoid getting constructive criticism for um, that there, it's just harder sometimes to hear the criticism from a colleague or a somebody who is more senior in your area at your institution. Um, and that 
be be willing and open to take that criticism. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to give criticism to people who are very defensive. Um, and that what I try to do when I write, even though I've been funded for a very, very long time, um, I actually am very fortunate now that I have two colleagues in my field, in my department now. And I try to get my first drafts of my grants done two or three weeks early and give it to my colleagues to read. Um, because I'd rather hear it from them than hear it from getting a bad score from study section. Um, but having, and people who say, oh, it's fine, when you know it wasn't because it didn't get funded, that you need to find those people who are willing to be the critical constructive colleague. That helps, Shannon, I hope. Um, does, does anybody else have, have any kind of questions for today, for right now? And um, that my email address, I'll put it in the chat. And um, I think it's also been on, on the emails that, um, Yeah, the other things that, so again to Carolyn, the other things that need to be included in the RFA, they usually are, um, but there's the, for NIH, there's the global RFA, and then there can be the specific RFAs. And since the RFA for NI, for the main NIH grant mechanisms is 100 plus pages, it's super easy to miss things um, that you need to include. and. It might be that it's, I, I sometimes would recommend to somebody to take an RFA with a highlighter and just force yourself to read the whole thing. Um, most of us don't read the big RFA because it is so long. And if you have submitted a lot of grants, um, if you don't keep track of the new announcements about when they change that global RFA, it's really easy to miss stuff. Like they have just changed the guidelines for the significant section to include scientific premise. We've always, you know, kind of thought about scientific premise in, in grants, but now there's this explicit thing where they want you to address the scientific um, premise. It looks like Aaron just included a video for sex as a biological factor. Um, the new inclusion of, of experimental subjects and patients across the lifespan is a brand new changed criteria for NIH. And it's in the RFA, but um, there's the main RFA, and then there's usually a set of amendments to that RFA, and then they reissue the full RFA again. And so this is like every couple years there's a new RFA, but the actual RFA is the RFA and the addenda. So it's a, it's a case where it can be sometimes hard to keep track of things. Um, so is that, I, I realize I'm kind of wishy-washying it, but you have to make sure you have gotten the most recent addenda to the, especially to the NIH main RFA. Any other questions for right now? Okay. So I hope to, you know, I want you to, everybody who has been funded by the MRAD, MRDA program, basically the Professional Development Corps is meant to be our resource. Um, that, um, oh, won't ERA Commons keep you honest and tell you if you're missing something? Not really, no. Um, the, essentially, I could, at the University of Delaware, we do not submit directly to ERA Commons because ERA Commons is so clunky. Um, we use a, um, another set of commercial software that has all of the sections that need to be um, filled out. And I just completely drew a blank on the name of the commercial software that the University of Delaware uses. Um, Cayuse, that's what it's called. 
Um, so we use a software called Caillouse um, that they actually, ERA Commons almost wants you to use a grant um, submission package. And there are also sections in, the problem is, is that there are lots of possible things that you could upload, like um, validation of biological resources. That's not needed for all grants, right? I mean, there are many of you who are MRDA folks who don't have any biological resources to validate because you're basically studying human behavior. Um, there's also um, some of you will have be creating new um, scientific resources that need to be have a resource sharing plan, but if you're um, or some of you are doing things that are creating very large data sets, you have to do the data set management plan. While my work, I would never do a data set management plan because I'm not creating large scale human clinical data. So not every piece needs to be included. And things such as sex as a biological variable and inclusion of patients across the lifespan that's just stuff you have to, that's stuff that has to be buried into the research plan. It's not a separate upload. So there's no way ERA Commons would know whether or not you've included or addressed that or not, because it's part of the text of the research plan. Um, and it's, it's actually not at all unusual for people to have missing data sharing plans and things like that. Um, so. This is a really good reason also to get your grants done really far ahead of time because your grants office will often be willing to read and check your grant over to make sure it's compliant. However, if you're, let's say for the most recent October 5th NIH deadline, if you had sent a, a draft of your grant to the research office by let's say September 10th or so, yes, they would have read it, they would have looked to make sure all the pieces are there and everything while you're still refining, you're still editing your research plan. However, if you turned all that stuff in on um, September, um, let's say 28th, which is when it was required to be in, the research office probably at University of Delaware probably got 50 grants that had to be submitted on that date deadline they simply didn't have the time to read everything and double check it was all there. So the earlier you do stuff, the earlier people can read it and help you make sure you don't forget anything. Okay. So, you know, please, you know, as you're developing your documents, please reach out to me, please reach out to Aaron, and please reach out to Rob Akins. Um, also, take advantage of um, being part of the Junior Investigator Network. The calls every week have a lot of informative things. There's the opportunity to ask questions there as well. And there's also the opportunity to um, find people who might have common problems. And if we have, if we can, we can try to help you with common solutions. Okay? So, with that, I will um, essentially um, talk to everybody in a month unless you reach out to um, us sooner, okay? And good luck working on your proposals, good luck developing things, and I hope to see you guys next month, okay? Bye.